So today's session is on the satanic verses and I've already done a session before and this is a very important topic to understand the genesis of Islam and who said what and how things are rolling and uh, you know basically what happened in the prophetic career of Muhammad. So, so stay with me, it's going to be very interesting and uh, I will not get into the last time's event or whatever and uh, if you're watching this on a, and if you're not watching this live it is there on a youtube channel on um, islamic scholar and 40 facts <laughs> no use types and yes i've created a playlist like that so uh, look it up and i'm sure that you'll be more than pleased on uh, what you see there and okay so as we go live let me just start off with the first uh, you know presentation on this okay about this session uh, what you'll see is that as much as Islamic apologists such as uh, you know Shoaib Akhtar was trying to Shoaib Sayyid rather <laughs> who's trying to make uh, uh, his career in um, apologist as an Islamic apologist uh, after Zakir Naik he was like the research scholar of uh, Dr. Zakir Naik so they bend over backwards as you can see to scream that a satanic versus just a conspiracy theory or it is a very weak story and is there any truth in the matter that Muhammad embraced, embraced polytheism to, to appease the masses. Uh, so watch and learn in this. This is going to be extremely interesting. As a word of thanks, I extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Uh, David Wood. Dr. David Wood for his support and a lot of content I got from him. He's an extremely uh, blessed uh, brother in Christ, extremely good in what he does. So my, my, my regards to him and his, uh, and the work he does him and Dr. and of course Sam Shimon. So my special thanks to him. So the Satanic verses fabricated or authentic. So these are the verses in question. This is actually, I have quoted the Quran, which is from, uh, we see that in Quran chapter 53, verse 19 and 20. Have you not heard of Allah al uzzah That is verse 19 and verse 20. This is Surah Najm, Al-Najm as it is called. And uh, Manad, the other, the third, the third, the other. So this is what is there in the Quran, 19 and 20. So there are other verses also after that. Then originally this verse is followed, also known as a satanic verse. It's not there in the Quran today, but we see that in numerous, numerous of Islamic sources, which simply says that these are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So who's Allah al-Luza and al-Manat? As if you have been following the series, Alat al luza and al manat are the three daughters of Muhammad. Yes, you heard me right. These are the pagan deities who are worshipped by the Quraysh tribe. And what they used to believe at that time is that uh, when you pray, uh, the cranes, literally those torques, you know, which bring baby stripes, they carry the prayers, your prayers to uh, to Allah via Alat, his daughters, Alat al luza and al manat. And there are these related verses, Quran chapter 73, 75, uh, 17 verse 73 to 75. And indeed, they were about to tempt you away from that which you really will to you in order uh, to make you invent about us something else. Okay, and on and on and on. And then verse 22, 52 to 53, which is also very important. And it did not send before you any messenger or prophet except that when he spoke, uh, Satan threw into it some misunderstanding, but Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in, then Allah makes precise his verses and Allah is unknowing. So this verse is supposed to be the uh, correction that came about after, um, you know, Muhammad has said those controversial verses. All right. So uh, moving ahead. Um, okay, one sec. And then we see that the truth is stranger than fiction. These are the satanic verses that we saw. Have you not heard of? This is the total satanic verses. So uh, just to let you know, satanic verses was not invented by Salman Rushdie. He simply said what is there in the satanic verses, uh, which, which is there in the Islamic literature. Have you not heard of Allah al Uzzah and al Manad the third? The third, the other, these are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So to see whether this is so, we'll be doing this in two ways. First, we'll be looking at the evidence because Dr. Shoaib Sayed frequently accuses me that I am not very clear in my evidence. And after that, we'll be getting into what uh, Dr. Sayed had to say about this 
definite happening that happened and um, and then if he has any queries on that and then um, you know if you have any queries on that we can take it all right so uh, that's where the satanic verses came from and let us just see how these things move we look at the historical method the historical method the methodology which is the historical method and the isnad criticism also all right so welcome again and to my presentation on the satanic verses i'm sorry i'm a bit delayed today again uh, technical issues i'm actually working from home so this work from home thing really gets on my nerves anyway so the satanic verses will be looking at whether the truth is stranger than fiction watch to find out more with evidence so many people say that it is a propaganda islamic propaganda no now the anti islamic propaganda by missionaries and the enemies of islam and we'll investigate today whether that is actually true or what so we will look at whether this thing is actually a conspiracy theory or this thing actually happened and muhammad embraced polytheism so and a special word of thanks to dr david ward from act 17 apologist apologetics a wonderful brother in christ he has extended a lot of support a lot of that content that i get i get it from him so um, god bless him and also brothers uh, brothers uh, like sam shamoon from whom like literally every one of us gets our content so the satanic verses fabricated or authentic so the verses in question now this i have actually quoted from sai international and this is what you see quran chapter 53 verse 19 have you not heard of allah tan aluza uh, that is verse 19 and then in 20th you see um, and manad the third the other and then originally uh, the verses which we was there sub, uh, in place which was removed later on was these are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for all right so this is what this entire four um, you know verses uh, comprise of the something called as a satanic verses um, and again just for your information so satanic verses is not something that is was cooked up by salman rushdie it was something these are the earliest these are there in the earliest of the islamic sources and it is not something which is um, you know which was said to be as uh, you know cooked up by anyone once again give me a minute please okay so these are the verses in question and then there are the related verses uh, we see that in quran chapter 17 verse 73 to 75 where indeed they were about to tempt you away and uh, uh, apparently they were not able to they, that's what they would want us to believe and uh, from that which we reveal to you in order to make you invent something about us uh, about uh, uh, make you invent about us something else and then they would have taken you as a friend and if you hadn't sent it to you you would have most inclined to them a little then if you had we would have made you taste double punishment in life and death double after death then you would not have been uh, then you would not find for yourself against us a helper um and we did not then we see in quran chapter 22 verse 52 to 53 and we did not send before you um any messenger or prophet except that uh that when he spoke or recited satan threw into it some misunderstanding but allah abolishes that which satan throws in then allah makes precise his verses and allah is knowing and wise all right so um this is what the controversial verses and the related verses are all about but these uh, quran chapter 17 verse 73 to 75 and quran 22 52 and 53 are not uh, you know like called as satanic verses only what you had seen earlier so we'll be looking at the historical method and the isnad criticism and then we'll be moving into um answering the queries of dr shoaib we'll be looking at the historical method so what we have brothers and sisters is that the earliest testimony earliest testimony of islamic scholars and i'll be showing you those testimonies 
confirm that Muhammad said those satanic verses. Of course, for then, uh, then for the next few hundred years, including up till now, 1400 years uh, down, uh, Islamic apologists are still, Islamic scholars are still uh, trying to find a way to explain it away, and I'll show you some of those methods. Um, the satanic verses are reported in our earliest biographical records, four of the earliest, and I'll show you that too. There are multiple sources. So when there is a historical method, they'll be look at, they'll be asking. So if there is some incident that comes up, a historian will ask, uh, is there early testimony to whatever the early testimony? Not not like came up a few hundred years after. Um, as soon as the event occurred, how close to the actual happening of the event do we have a testimony? So that's the early testimony, and then it's not just one testimony. Maybe somebody got it wrong. So then the historian asks the next question. Do we have multiple sources to attest the authenticity of this event? That's multiple sources. So do we have multiple sources? Uh, yes, we do. We have approximately 37 sources. And if you look at independence, we are looking at maybe 23 to 25 independent sources for the event. Uh, then that's the independent sources that we spoke about. These are uh, multiple independent sources, Kabal al-Qurazi, uh, I cannot even pronounce this, uh, Abu Bakr ibn Abd al-Rahman, Abu al-Aliya, al-Sudi, Muhammad ibn al-Saib, Qatada ibn, I, I don't know, I can't pronounce this, you can read it on the screen. All right, uh, there are so many. And finally, the, the cousin of Muhammad in itself, uh, himself, which is uh, Ibn Abbas, who attests to the authenticity of these uh, of this event actually happening. Uh, that is the first thing. And then as we move ahead, so these are the independent sources, so many of them, at least 20 plus sources are there. And there is a principle of embarrassment. Now, all these independent, all these sources that I quoted are not uh, Christian sources. These are not anti-Islamic Western sources. These are Islamic sources. They have nothing to, and they have nothing to gain by, um, you know, making up such stories. They have everything to lose. But so that is my tribute to this scholars of Islam who are not like uh, the the so-called scholars of today who would look at erasing a part of their embarrassing history. So if it happened, yes. If you're embarrassed about it, okay, I understand. And but I still applaud that you took took it upon yourself to. Uh, actually say that this thing happened. So that is a uh, principle of embarrassment. So here we look at some of the independent sources that we have. And if you look at it, all the 37 sources that we have of the stories, six, six of them, my brothers and sisters, six go back to Kaab al Quraisi that we saw earlier, the name. Um, then five go back to uh, Urwa ibn Zubair. Uh, that, that is the, uh, you know, how independent it is. Uh, he was also the uh, Aisha's nephew, Abu Bakr's grandson, and the son of Abu Bakr's daughter, Asma, and one of the first 20 converts to Islam. So he has absolutely no reason why to make up a story because, uh, um, you know, I, and I'll put it up maybe later on. That is, Zakir Nayak in one of his uh, videos answering a friend of mine actually said on live uh, QA that this was a story made up by the Mushriks of Mecca. So was uh, my question in that case was to Dr. Syed and to Zakir Nayak is, was, is Urwa ibn al-Zubair a uh, mushrik of Mecca? And then to, back, uh, to go back to um, you know uh, Abu Bakr ibn al-Rahman, who was one of the top uh, scholars in Islamic law during the first century. These all go back to the first century and some to the second. So it is the early testimony that really, really matters. Then five go back to Abu al-Aliyah, then two go back to Al-Sudi, another scholar who studied under Ibn Abbas. Then one comes from the tafsir of Muhammad Ibn Al-Sayyid, um, who, com who composed the longest tafsir that has been written until this time. So uh, it is as if you look at the video of our uh, Dr. Sayyid, uh, he is actually just quoting, um, uh, you know, Ta you know Tabari. Tabari is also one of the historians, and uh, he had also written. Um, a detailed accounts of Muhammad. Of course, he does say that he has no way to confirm uh, a few of the things that he has written, but uh, that doesn't mean that you can discard the whole thing. And these are a few more of the independent sources. Four go back to 
Qatada ibn Dama, who's one of Islam's greatest earlier commentators, one go back to al dahak a first century expert in tafsir. This is all first century. And then one goes back to Ikrama, a, a slave of Ibn Abbas, who was the cousin of Muhammad, and an expert, he was a, an expert on the life of Muhammad. You have six report that go back to Ibn Abbas himself. The satanic verses formed a very uh, formed a very uh, deep part from a very deep part of the memory and recollection of uh, the first 150 years of Islam and was recorded by almost all the prominent scholars working in the field of Tafsir and Sira magazine. So as per Shadab, he was also he is also Harvard scholar in Islamic studies and has done his PhD on the Satanic verses. Can you believe an Islamic scholar doing his PhD on the Satanic verses? And he says the the Satanic verses incidents in uh, is there in the memory of the early Muslim community, uh, and his dissertation was was written as an analysis of the early rivayas and the isnads. So that's how the independent sources work. And uh, here we see Alfred Guillaume. Uh, who is also a scholar on Islam and he says it is impossible to suggest a motive that would induce early Muslims to write such a story about the Prophet unless it were true. If historical evidence is to be given any value, we must hold that Muhammad pronounced these words in the middle of Surah 53. And then we see Mardgarni Wat who says uh, Muhammad must have publicly recited the satanic verses as part of the Quran. It is unthinkable that the story could have been invented by Muslims or foisted upon them by non-Muslims. So, important question. What is this entire scenario of the satanic verses, guys? So, let me just read it to you from the uh, uh, Sirat al-Rasul, which is the earliest biography of Muhammad. I'm actually reading it, all right? I'm actually reading it. It's not something that I'm making it up, all right? So if you want, you can ping me, drop me a message, and I will actually send you a photocopied version of Sirat al-Rasul. It is there on page number 165 and 166. I'm reading it. I'm not making this up, all right? Now, I'm actually reading now, right? Page, page number 165, um, third paradigm, all right? Now, the Prophet was anxious for the welfare of his people, wishing to attract them as far as he could. It has been mentioned that he longed for a way to attract them. And the method he adopted is what Ibn Hamid told me that Salama said, uh, Salama said uh, bin Ishaq and told him that Yazid ibn of Medina from, he's given the entire Isnad. From um, uh, from Kaab al Qurayzi, when the when the apostle saw that his people turned their backs on him, and he was pained by their estrangement, because obviously, see, he was uh, he was he loved his tribe, and I don't blame him for it. He was from the Quraysh tribe. He wanted them desperately to come to uh, Islam, but he used to mock them for their polytheistic faith. And okay, see, uh, Muhammad never claimed to be able to do any. Uh, miracles. He never did any miracles in his life and he claimed that the Quran is his miracle because it's so beautifully written and so he'd go and recite various verses and then his criterion would be oh how beautiful are the verses that I've spoken. So what would happen uh, is that the uh, the people at that time would then uh, then uh, say, then somebody would actually stand up and say that okay I'm also reciting a verse. What is the difference between my verse and his? So Muhammad was deeply uh, wanting his people to come to Islam and take him as a prophet. So that's what I'm reading now. So, um, pain, uh, so when the apostle saw that his people turned their backs on him and he was paid by their estrangement from what he bought them from God, uh, he longed that they should come to him, uh, there should come to him from God a message that would reconcile his people to him. Because of his love for his people and his anxiety over them that it would delight him, he, uh, if the obstacle that made his task so difficult would be removed, so that he meditated on the project and longed for it and it was dear to him. Then God said, I'm actually reading this, all right? Then God sent down by the star, that is Najam, when it, when it, by the star, when it sets your comrade is not and it and is not deceived, he speaks not from his own desires. And when he reached his words, that is now his quoting, uh, um, you know, uh, Sirat al Najam from verse uh, from the verse verses onwards. Uh, and he says, when he reached his words, have you thought of Allah al Luzan and Manad the third, the other 
Satan, when he was meditating upon it, upon it and desiring to bring it, see, look at how Ibn Ishaq has inserted this part, that Satan was. So he doesn't say that Muhammad uh, did it on his own. He said Satan was there when he was meditating upon it and desiring to bring it, that is reconciliation to his people, put upon his tongue. So Satan put upon it. Now I'm reading it from Ibn Ishaq, which is the earliest biography of Muhammad. These are the exalted garink or the cranes whose intercession is approved, is hoped for. When the Quraysh, listen to this, when the Quraysh heard that, they were delighted and greatly pleased at the way in which he spoke of their gods and they listened to him while the believers were holding that what the Prophet brought to them from the Lord was true, not suspecting a mistake or a vain desire or a slip. Uh, and when he reached the prostration at the end of the surah in which he prostrated himself, the Muslims prostrated themselves when the Prophet prostrated confirming what he bought and obeying his command. And the polytheists of Quraysh and others who are in the, in the mosque prostrated when they heard the mention of their gods so that everyone in the mosque, believer and unbeliever, prostrated except Al-Wahab Al-Mugaira who was an old man who could not do so. So he took a handful of dirt from the valley and bent over it. Then the people dispersed and Quraysh went out, delighted at what had been said about their God, saying, Muhammad has spoken of our gods in splendid fashion. He alleged it in what he read that they were that they are the exalted garing or cranes whose intercession is approved. So this is the entire incident. So um, this this is exalted crane whose intercession is hoped for is now no longer there in the Quran, but we see it in the earliest sources of uh, uh, the, the uh, of Islam. Here is a sample is not. So many of the scholars, so-called scholars like even Dr. Shoaib, say that the sample is not, that is is not or the uh, chain of narration is wrong or incorrect. And so here is a sample is not. It goes all the way down to Ibn, Isa, Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas was the founder of Quranic studies of Islam and he was also the cousin of Muhammad. How could you say that he did something, he made up something in his mind? And another sample is not all the way uh, down to Ibn Abbas. So it, this is not like said by any Tom, Dick and Harry. This was said by the, uh, the, the people who are closest to Muhammad itself. And then as we move ahead, the conclusions are, what we see is that the satanic verses are confirmed by historical method. They are confirmed by Sira al magazi standards and they are confirmed by Isnad criticism. Now, um, many uh, people would dismiss the Sira as being, uh, you know, something that cannot be, you know, trusted or depended upon. Well, without, please understand brothers and sisters, without the Sirah, you don't know much about the life of Muhammad in itself anyway. You don't know, you don't have much to say about the life of Muhammad anyway. You don't have any, anything in your hands. Few stray literary, few, few stray verses might make sense here and there, but who he was, how he lived, uh, how, he, how he passed on judgment, what he said, didn't say, all these things comes from this uh, Sira, all these autobiographical, <coughs> sorry, all this biographical literature on Muhammad itself. So this is Sira literature is not something that can be dismissed out by anyone. So let us look at a few of the objections by Dr. Syed. <coughs> in that sequel, in that program, Narendra Sahu raised one question about satanic verses, saying that there are many hadith about satanic verses, which speaks about and how could Prophet Muhammad utter those words being a prophet of God. Now, I insisted on that day that all the narrations, all the hadiths regarding satanic verses are undoubtful. They are not authentic. They are fabricated. And this is what I studied and this is what I remember that all the hadiths are fabricated. Now today, inshallah, I will deal in detail about this fabrication. So, uh, Tafsir ibn Kafir. Tafsir ibn Kafir, the great scholar, is the commentator of the Quran. 
he mentions about these cytotonic verses. And the, the cytotonic verses in question are, they are the exalted granik whose intercession is to be hoped for. Tafsir ibn Kafir, the great scholar, he says, this report is undoubtedly false on a number of counts. First point he says, if it's not is very weak and is not correct. So he says the chain of relation that we have for this hadith on certain equations are very weak and it is not correct, it is not sunny. Second point he says, the Prophet peace upon him was infallible with regard to the conveying of this message. So he was infallible. Third point he says, even if this report was sunny, correct, for argument's sake, the scholars have stated that it is to be understood as meaning that the shaitan caused the kufar to hear these words. The Satan caused the kufar to hear these words. Not that he put them in the mouth of the Prophet peace upon him. So they heard from him, the shaitan, not from Prophet Muhammad. See Ibn Qasim's preparation of this in his Qasim of Surah Hajj, chapter 22 of now look at the uh, you know crazy logic of Islam, and this is not my logic. This is Islam. And look at point number two. The Prophet uh, was infallible with regards to conveying of this message. He's saying Ibn Kathir said this. You have now. If I'm not a believer in Islam, it is up to you to prove that he was not fallible. You cannot, you know, it, it is like uh, uh, the mother of a spoiled child. Uh, you, uh, Salafis and Wahhabis, like uh, Dr. Uh, Shoaib, are more like uh, the mother of a spoiled child. And they don't even want to listen to any sort of logic. They assume in advance that the child is infallible. The child couldn't have done anything like this wrong at all. That is like, you have pre-assumed what you want to uh, prove in the first place. That is circular logic. So he was infallible, cannot be, uh, um, you know, cannot be taken as the logic. Like I can, it is as uh, stupid as saying that Jesus was infallible. He couldn't have sinned in the first place. I, I have to prove that. From the verses. I'll have to prove that from the Bible that he has not sinned. I'll have to prove that from his behavior patterns that he has not sinned. I cannot say that because he couldn't have sinned, that's why this uh, particular incident never happened. That is crazy, stupid logic. But welcome to the world of Islamic, if you can call it as logic. So let's move ahead. Okay. And he says, uh, okay, here again, he says about Tafsir ibn Kathir, and he says many of these stories uh, come from very, um, you know, weak sources. And then he goes on to say, one sec, this is like very, very, um, you know, long extended video. I can't play a one hour video for you. Uh, I'll put it in my, uh, you know, uh, link if you wish. Now, uh, he, 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 he even mentioned something about Tabari putting a disclaimer uh, that is what is whatever has been written by uh, uh, by him might not be fully reliable in the first place. Uh, yes, that's what he does right Tabari. Uh, but the whole point is that does it mean that he throw away the whole book? For me not to believe that something that he writes. Why doesn't so my question to Dr. Uh, Shoaib and the rest of the Muslim world is that why don't you just burn the books of Tabari and say this is a heretical book and there is no truth in this at all. Unless you do that, you will have to show that what Tabari has written is actually incorrect. The weak narration. So let us just look at the first uh, objection. There is a weak narration. The story is, uh, so are the response of mine. The story is transmitted by the four early biographers of Muhammad's life, Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, Ibn Saad, and Tabari. So it is not just Tabari who is saying about it, and I'm just quoting um, <clears throat> this one is. Yeah, so Brother Jinto is saying that please share some notes if they are there in PDF or format. 
and yeah, surely we'll do that, brother. So um, Ibn Saad, so there are these four biographers of Muhammad's life, Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, Ibn Saad, and Tabari. So um, Dr. Shoaib Sayyid saying that Tabari could have made a mistake is, uh, well, possibly he could have, but then I have three other sources. It's not just one early biographer saying something about uh, Muhammad that can be discarded. There were three other biographers, Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, and Ibn Saad, who wrote the same thing. Ibn Saad did use Waqidi's material, but he is also a scholar in his own right and did a great deal of research himself. So again, brings us back to the principle of embarrassment. These people were the earliest followers. Some were uh, in the first 20 uh, followers of Muhammad, first 20 believers of Islam. They had nothing to uh, gain by putting up these stories. They were not enemies of Islam. They were not Christian apologists. They were not uh, conspiracy by the West. They were uh, basically uh, good Muslims who were historians and they followed a very ethical way of working. So my hats off to them. So moving ahead, there is evidence on the hadith. Now this is interesting. Now this is circumstantial evidence. Now stay with me on this, all right? Stay with me on this. Uh, Sayyid uh, Bukhari, volume number two, book number 19, hadith number 176. And uh, narrated by Abdullah ibn bin Masood, uh, the Prophet recited Surah Najm and prostrated while reciting it, and all the people prostrated. And a man among the people took a handful of stones or earth uh, and raised it to his face and said, "This is sufficient for me." And later on, I saw him killed as a non-believer. So that's a different part. Muhammad did kill a lot of people, so why he was killed is not the topic at this point. So <laughs> we'll just move on. And so, see, the, the, the key point that you need to understand is what do you mean by this is sufficient for me? What is the meaning of this? What is this that is sufficient for me? What did Muhammad say? That is a question. What did Muhammad say in Surah Al-Najm that is so groundbreaking, earth-shaking that the unbelievers of Quraysh finally accepted him as a prophet of God? Look at another Sahih al-Bukhari verse. Volume number 2, book number 19, Hadith number 177. The Prophet, I prostrated and I prostrated while uh, uh, reciting on Najm and with them prostrated the Muslims, the pagans, the jinns and all human beings. And again, the key is over here, the pagans. So until that point, they had not been prostrating in, uh, when Muhammad was praying. Rather, they were mocking him and making fun of him. Why did they prostrate now? What was so, as I said, groundbreaking that shook their inner conscience and made them happy? And we look at this answer in, uh, you know, even Ishaq, what I read, so the pagans were happy and they went back saying, oh, finally he's accepted our polytheism. <clears throat> so, uh, again, it is there also in volume number six, Sayyid Bukhari, book number 16, number three, it is six. Uh, and look at this narr narrated, Abdullah, The first surah in which a prostration was mentioned was Surah Al-Najm. Allah the Prophet prostrated while reciting it and every period behind him prostrated. And again my question is why? And over here if you look at this Sayyid al-Bukhari hadith, it was narrated by Ibn Abbas, the cousin of Muhammad himself. So my question again would be why, why did the pagans prostrate in front of Muhammad when Muhammad read these verses. Now, then he goes on to say, uh, let me play that video for you. They were revealed historically seven years later after the alleged satanic incident. So the verses, Surah Isra chapter 17 was number 72, 75. And chapter 22 was number 52, which is supposed to be rebuking the prophet on this aspect. They were not connected to the incident. They were revealed seven years later after the satanic process. So how can you say that these are revealed to the rebuke of the prophet? Okay, so he says these, these verses, uh, 17, 72, 75, and 22, 52 were revealed much 
historically several years later. Now again, there's a lot of presumption by these uh, Salafis who are readily making up stories and readily even whitewashing the deeds of Muhammad. So um, let's just see, the verses are revealed later. That's the objection. It presumes that the chronology of the Quran is known. Well, uh, brothers and sisters, there is a big eye opener for you over here. That is the chronology of the Quran is still a contentious topic. It is nothing that has been revealed uh, you know, at the time of Muhammad itself, that this is the chronology of the Quran. The chronology of the Quran is from the largest to the smallest. So that's how it is. And even within each surah, there is the continuity is not there. It is not that the first surah came first, second surah came second, and the verses in first surah was narrated in sequence. No, no, no. We frequently even are told that Muhammad told that the verses that he spoke at one time were to be recited with verses revealed at a much later, earlier time. So Muhammad himself even changed the sequence. And to this date, Islamic scholars have been unable to determine a unified chronological sequence of the revelation of the Quran's chapters. So saying that this was revealed much later is like, you know, assuming too much, you're assuming that you know the sequence. There is no such sequence known. And while there are certain portions that can be put in some logical sequence, much of it, there are some logical chronology that can be there. Let me accept that. But much of the Quran that we have cannot be known with 100% surety on the chronology of the verses. And the early Muslim sources, we see Tabari and Ibn Saad. I don't want... Uh, people to say that I'm only quoting Tabari. Tabari and Ibn Saad say that these verses were revealed around the time of the satanic verses were spoken by Muhammad and not at the time of Piraj. And even when I read Ibn Ishaq, if I go reading further down, uh, in the same chapter, page number 166, uh, going down, 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 you can see that these other verses also are getting re recited uh, uh, among them. So I, as I read from the same, uh, from the Sirat al-Rasul, page number 166, in continuation to what I read earlier, the news reached the Prophet's company. I'm reading Ibn Ishaq, okay? The Sirat al-Rasul. Uh, the news reached the Prophet's companions who were in Abyssinia. It is being it being reported that the Quraysh had accepted Islam. So some men started to return while others remained behind. Then Gabriel came to Apostle and said, what have we done, Muhammad? You have read to these people something that I did not bring you from God, and you have said what, uh, what, uh, you know what, and you have said what he did not say to you means Allah. The apostle was was bitterly grieved and was greatly in fear of God. So God sent down a revelation for he was merciful to him, confirm, uh, comforting him and make light of the matter of the affair and telling him that every prophet and apostle spoke before him desired as he desired and wanted what he wanted and satan interjected something into his desires as he had on his tongue so god annulled what satan had agreed, uh, suggested and god sent down now the next verse we have not sent down a prophet or apostle before you but when he longed satan cast apprehension into his longing but god will annul which satan has suggested then god will establish his verses god being knowing and wise and so, this, these verses, uh, what we saw earlier, sorry, I'm just going back, yeah. So what I read in Ibn Ishaq in succession to what the, what the narration was, we see this Quran chapter 22 verse 52 to 53 just in the next paragraph in itself, not years later. And let's assume, I just thought of an interesting point, just, uh, you know, what you have to understand is that the sequence, again, is extremely important in which it, uh, in which it happened. Uh, look, look at this. Again, I'm reading page number 166 uh, of uh, Spirit al-Rasul. The news reached the Prophet's companion who were in Abyssinia. It being reported that the Quraysh had accepted Islam as some men started to return while, while others remained um behind remain behind and then we see that uh, you know 
some people even rejected islam because now muhammad no longer was uh, teaching monotheism but he was accepting idolatry and then some people returned and when muhammad heard this at that time gabriel came to the apostle and said what have you done now it might seem a distance of just three lines from the narration of the satanic verses and this muhammad's so called you know um, rectification verses that came from gabriel the time duration now abyssinia is ethiopia and going by the it is more than uh, like almost uh, 1500 miles or something like that and by that standard it is it would have taken them uh, a few months to come down from abyssinia to mecca so it is not something that they were next door and they came and asked muhammad what have we done wrong and so we are leaving islam so muhammad saw that he was people were deserting him is no longer like a monotheistic uh, in a prophet like what we see in jews in, in the judaism so my question is why didn't this rectification verses of the the blunder of muhammad come immediately was allah watching taking rest forgot what muhammad said or did allah momentarily remember that he had three daughters or what happened why the delay these verses should have come immediately and if i even look at um, you know uh, now i'm getting the sequence from uh, ibn ishaq uh, from uh, ibn ishaq that is they are in chronology of this event and they happened immediately after some time after muhammad said these verses and here we see that even dr shoaib sayed says that these were revealed historically several years later i would say several months dr shoaib says several years so my question is why in case muhammad did make a sin or did say something wrong why was allah waiting for so many years before sending down the rectification verses that is my question so moving ahead guys uh, so the next verse which is 21 is the male for you and for him the female uh that then is an unjust division well guys now what is the meaning of verse 21 and 22 let's assume we remove those red colored satanic verses what is the meaning of um verse 21 and 22 actually speaking if you look at it allah is simply asking okay so see uh, now if you look at it from the historical perspective even today um uh, like most eastern cultures uh, the even the arabs would be looking for a male heir for a male inheritor so what allah is simply saying is that okay allah ka uzal al manat all three are women all three are females and you have given me three daughters so male you want male male sons but you have given me female daughters and it's very unfair so that is allah protesting so is allah is also like sexist and he believes that uh, you know male boys are better than females so 21 verse 22 also supports this uh, satanic verses that is happening now in 23 and 24 is something that uh, what has been said and why it has been said is something that i leave uh, you know the quran to uh, what to say match up the mess that is happening it is for not for me to explain if it doesn't match it doesn't match you can't say that because the addition doesn't match therefore it never happened the quran anyway has un understandable content in it so just because a content is un uh, some more content that you find objectionable is uh, is there you cannot simply throw away the baby with the bath water in itself So let's move ahead quickly now. Those slides. So I'm asking, do those verses, do the couplets, match in between the context of the Quran? Absolutely, they do not match. They don't match. Like the example that I gave about Donald Trump, even these two statements, even these, even these two couplets, do not match the context. Qadi Al Iyad, the Judge Iyad statement, is a great scholar. He mentions in his Al Shifa. He mentions, and I quote him: "Suffice it for you that this narration was not documented by any of the scholars of some hadith. The narrator interested in it are the types of commentators and historians who are interested in every strange matter. 
blindly compiling from the books everything their hands fall upon. Many of these narrations were not there. He's saying this is all so many scholars are saying that it is not there. But I have also shown you that uh, these are, um, what to say, these are there as per the earliest sources of Quran. And so what the scholars, their so-called scholars have to say is something that uh, they need to, this is nothing more than uh, the Islamic scholars trying to whitewash uh, the deeds of Muhammad, uh, many a time assuming that Muhammad could never have done a misdeed himself. Now I'll show you something really interesting. Another scholar by Nicol, Nicholas, Nicolai Sinai, he's an orientalist, he's a white person, he says on satanic verses, he says one must therefore conclude that the Quranic verses are apocryphal, apocryphal means doubtful, and were not originally part of the surah. See what Nicholas Sinai, an uh, orientalist, white person, he is mentioning in his historical Quran, in his, in his historical critic of Quran. One must therefore conclude that the satanic courses, Garani courses, are apocryphal. Apocryphal means doubtful. And were not originally part of the Surah. This conclusion is also confirmed by the fact stressed previously by John Burton. He mentions, Nicholas Sinai, he mentions that in the Tafsir tradition of the Qurani courses exhibit a strong connection with Q2252. 2252 says, We have never sent any messenger or prophet before you into who wishes Satan did insinuate something. But God removes what Satan insinuates and then God affirms his message, God is all-knowing and wise, which is said to have been revealed as a divine reassurance in the wake of Granic incident, thus it is the Granic incident. It is thus it makes sense to accept Burton's explanation as the Granic incident as a fictitious occasion of revelation. Fictitious occasion of revelation for Quran chapter 22 verse 32, albeit one that proved to be a grave liability for later and more theological conscientious Muslims. Okay, so now look look at the fun over here. What he's saying is that, uh, now I'm reading, now you heard him, now I'm reading it again, what he said. Thus it makes sense to accept Burton's explanation as the, um, the Garanic incident as a fictitious occasion of revelation uh, for 22. And below, before that he says, Uh, read the first one. That the, that the Garanic verses are apocryphal and were not originally part of the Surah. So, when we see it in the Quran that we see now, it is 53, 19, 20 that we see now, are also related to the Satanic verses. Then the whole point is that what was the context of that 53, 19 and 20? If you have to discard, you have to discard all 20, 19, 20 and 21. For you, the females, for me the females and you the males. So uh, by saying this, I, I praise God because Dr. Shoaib said it himself. He has quoted some uh, Nikolai Sinai as some scholar. And this proves that even the Quran contains apocryphal matter. So the Quran is corrupt and it is not from God. This is something which is a great takeaway and we see this mistake being done again and again by uh, Dr. Sayed. It gets very difficult, I'm sure, for him to understand logic being a Muslim himself. Mm -hmm. It was also said that Prophet, peace be upon him, used to recite the Quran slowly. He used to recite the Quran slowly, so that the devil, so that the devil lay wait in, lay wait, so that the devil in wait, lay in wait for one of the poses and uttered those words in question in the same timbre voice. Those that were near him heard it, as if coming from the Prophet. 
those that were near him heard it as if coming from the prophet. He looked upon him and they attributed to him. It was not from prophet, it was from Satan. <coughs> now did you realize this what he said the amazing madness in Islam so it was not Muhammad saying so maybe he was relating Surah Al-Najam and uh, you know when he took a pause maybe he was coughing or maybe he was having some water then Muhammad then Satan uh, said those verses in the voice of Muhammad itself. I'm sorry. No, no, just, no I don't have COVID. All right. So, <laughs> uh, so they they thought that Muhammad said it, but it was not from Muhammad. It was from the devil. Now, so now let us tie up with those Surah al bakari verses uh, that we saw, Sahih uh, Hadith verses. So, when the pagans heard it, they rejoiced and they prostrated. Now just just imagine, all right? Just imagine, uh, because these so scholars are very keen to, you know, even Dr. Shoaib would be attributing Deuteronomy chapter 18 to uh, Muhammad itself, like a prophet, like Moses. So let's imagine, okay? Muhammad, the, Moses is giving the law of God, you know, which you see in the say the Ten Commandments, or that we see in Numbers, or Leviticus, or Deuteronomy. And at that time, the devil says something. It never happened. Never happened in the Holy Bible because uh, obviously Moses was a much more prophet, uh, you know, powerful prophet than Muhammad. So it never happened. But let's assume if it would have happened, what would we have expected God to do? Any any thoughts on that? What would we have accepted God? Immediately, there should be repercussions. Immediately, there should be corrections because people were being led astray. Or was, uh, you know, Allah also rejoicing that, okay, it's a misconception, fine, they understood it from the devil, but I'm getting more believers, so it is fine. Was that what happened? Let's assume, like you are a pastor and you, you, uh, you didn't say something and you were preaching, and uh, let's assume you are preaching to somebody and uh, there is a misunderstanding that happens. Would you, maybe you didn't say it, maybe there was some uh, audio feedback in the mic system that you're using or something. And what would you do? Would you not immediately correct and say, no, 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 this is not what I said. Whether you like it or wrong, not, I don't, I don't care. This is not what I said. This is what I said because this is what I quote from the Bible. You would. But here we see that not happening. Let's assume that this alternative so-called opinion that Dr. Syed has given is correct. Even including that of Nikolai Sainasaina and it is all apocryphal. Never happened. But we see in the Bukhari, we see in the earliest of Islamic sources that it actually happened. Now let's assume it was not Muhammad speaking, it was the devil speaking. Was it not incumbent on Allah and Muhammad to rectify the mistake immediately? In the words of Dr. Shoaib himself, the correction came months and years after the actual narration of the incident. Months and years after the narration of the incident. I, it just reminds me, um, you, you know, of a particular prophet. Let me just look it up. First Kings chapter 13. Uh, let me read it out to you. Um, there is this, um, okay, the, and behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the, by the word of the Lord of, by the word of the Lord to Bethel, Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of God and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice to you, the priest of the high places who make offerings on you, and the bow, and the human bone shall be turned, burned on you. So going, going ahead. We read in verse um, 7, after he made this thing, the, the king was very angry and then he tried to harm the prophet, but the uh, king himself was harmed. So the king understood that this is a prophet from God. So in verse 7, the king says, and the king said to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. 
And the man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded to me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. And then going ahead, we see that another prophet comes and says, and gives him a false word. And uh, so, the, uh, so the first prophet follows this lying prophet and he defies the word of God. And when he's going back, he was killed by a lion. The repercussions, my friends, the repercussions was immediate. It was not like a few days and a few years. But here we see that Allah, for some reason, was actually waiting. He was waiting. So again, um, and then we see over here, uh, one sec. These alternative opinions that we have of uh, these alternative opinions that uh, we see people like, like Dr. Shoaib say, that the devil uttered the words in the same timber voice. And we just saw um, the, the response to that. And then let us see what uh, what else Dr. Shoaib has to say. For the prophet, those that were near him heard it as if coming from the prophet is upon him. And they attributed it verses were purported to belong. Was revealed in one of in one whole in the tenth year of the Hijrah. The whole of the Sunnah chapter 53 was revealed in the tenth year of the Hijrah. Again, so he says the return from the Abyssinians was revealed in the 10th year of Hijrah, which was much before or something that he says. Now, um, I just read for you Ibn Ishaq, page number 165, 166, and it is given in a chronological order. Here again, Dr. Shoaib has done the same mistake of assuming that we know the Quranic chronology with 100% certainty, which is not the case. If I read these four uh, tafsirs, uh, siras, it happened in the sequence, followed by the return from the... The story of the Rishi, how can... Because the many Greek chains when looked at together, the revelation, Satanic Moses' story is unreliable. Some may try to appeal in the Hajar argument regarding the story being authentic because the many Greek chains when looked at together give the story a basis. This is the argument of Ibn Sayyid. But however, Sheikh Dr. Imad Sayyid al sharbini in his book, Rad al-Shukhat, Hawal al-Asmaat al-Nabi, Fidal al-Quran wa Sunnah, page 355-356, so again, I'll just cut it out. Actually, it's just stretching out too much. Well, again, um, what we see is that he's again quoting scholar upon scholar, which is the latest scholars, the whitewashing scholars of Islam, trying to cover up this very embarrassing incident in Muhammad's prophetic career. But guys, uh, please stay with me on this. Please understand that what I quoted was from the earliest sources of the Quran earliest, the four earliest biographies of Muhammad speak about it. If you throw out these four siras, you have nothing left to know about the life of Muhammad. Without the life of Muhammad being known, your entire Islam falls like a you know, pack of cats. Just straight falls down. There is nothing, nothing left. Without the life of on times of Muhammad, you have nothing left in Islam. As a Islam, as a Muslim, as an Orthodox Muslim, a Salafi, Wahhabi and all, they are supposed to be following the example of Muhammad. You get to know the example of Muhammad from primarily from the Sira. You don't have it, you have nothing. You might get some stray thoughts here and there, from Ibn Kathir and all those play people. But again, they also mostly would be quoting from the Sira in itself. So when you are dismissing the Sira that I quoted as unreliable, you are dismissing the entire life of Muhammad in itself. I didn't quote uh, some scholar saying this or that. I have many scholars who agree on the Muhammad saying the, uh, you know, uh, satanic verses. 
there is even uh, okay there is even uh, you know um, evidence in the um, sahi hadith that muhammad himself was demon possessed at one time for a period of, of at least 6 months that he was uh, demon possessed so muhammad and uh, demons and uh, you know black magic was not something unrelated or unheard of this was something which was uh, known from that time it cannot be listened to the hearing of the unbelievers the alleged couplet was put by satan into the hearing of the unbelievers dr mohar ali also notes on page number 697 yet other version state yet other version state that it was neither the prophet nor satan but someone from among the unbelievers who uttered the alleged verses when the prophet had just completed the recitation of ayah 19 of the surah okay so here he gives two arguments very interesting look at how dedicated he is he gives two arguments and but look at the tap dancing you know just to cover up the embarrassment that the alleged couplet was put by satan into the hearing of the disbelievers so again see the same the same question that i would like to ask why didn't allah give the correction but did allah know that oh my god no these people are following me by mistake because they think uh, that uh, muhammad is preaching polytheism he is not preaching polytheism so now no, muhammad get up now and tell them that this never happened i never said this that didn't happen at all so assuming that this was put by satan into the hearing of the unbelievers why didn't allah take corrective steps immediately or, or was allah also like a cheap politician who was into vote bank politics and people casting the vote at any cost was fine with him that is the question that dr shoaib has to answer all this muslims have to answer and again the next thing yet other versions say it was neither the prophet nor satan but some one from the unbelievers so while he was quoting verse 19 then he finished recitation of verse 19 from 53 somebody spoke the other verses from the unbelievers and people thought that it was muhammad again so by my response is the same why didn't allah issue corrective action immediately what was allah waiting for why didn't allah immediately issue steps for rectification he didn't because muhammad actually said it the satanic verses muhammad actually lied if possible or muhammad was demon possessed i am okay with all the explanations take your pick just when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he gives a nice, uh, next this was not a new composition it was known from before composition made on the occasion mentioned so this satanic couplet was not a new composition it was known from before the kurish the pagans the mushriks they used to utter they used to recite this couplet while circumambulate in the kaaba it was an old couplet which the kurish pagans used to recite in praise of their goddess listen carefully guys this was not a new composition it was known from before the kurish the pagans the mushriks they used to utter they used to recite this couplet while circumambulate in the kaaba so the mushriks and the pagans used to narrate this couplet while circumambulating the kaaba so in one stroke trying to defend muhammad dr shoaib again has proved that islam is pagan it has pagan practices the circumambulating the kaaba he only said it that the mushriks and the pagans used to do that so in other words he is proving what i had said earlier that muhammad carried forward the pagan rituals of his pagan tribe the quraish so thank you dr shoaib for proving that islam is false islam carries pagan practices it was an old couplet which the quraish pagans used to recite in praise of the goddesses while sotam and breathing the kaaba it is also to be remembered that the unbelievers used to create noise and disturbances whenever the prophet or the muslim recited the quran publicly therefore it is very likely that when the prophet recited the surah and mentioned allah ta'ala 
in the course of the reflection and in a dimension to explain some of the Quraysh unbelievers instantly interrupted, interjected and protested by shouting out that couplet. So it was the Quraysh, it was the non-Muslims, it was, it was the Mushriks, the unbelievers, they interjected, they interrupted in the recitation of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they shouted those couplet which was known to them, it was not a new couplet. Excellent. I don't know, maybe Dr. Shwagab doesn't really think when he's talking. And it brings my same question ahead. Why didn't Allah issue corrective steps? Now, now let, let, let me make another example. Let's assume, you, um, you know, I, a sinner, okay, in there, or any Bible-believing Christian, he is talking to Muslims, trying to show that Jesus is God, Christian Trinity, or he speaks about Christian Trinity, or he speaks that Muhammad is a false prophet, or he speaks about, uh, and he's speaking about Muhammad being a false prophet and Jesus being the son of God. Now let's assume, like I'm speaking to a group of Muslims and somebody shouts from the background, yeah, yeah, okay, so Jesus is not God and Muhammad is the true prophet. And let's assume the rest of the Muslims in a very stupid manner think that I have said it and r run forward and hug me and say, thank you, brother, praise be to Allah that you have now accepted that Muhammad is a prophet and Jesus is not the son, is not God. What will I do? By If I have even an ounce of uh, honesty and love for my God, I will not even wait for God to correct me. I will immediately say, no, I never said this. I love you like a brother and I want you to accept Christ, but I never said this. I never said, this was somebody else shouting. Don't you understand? It was not me. It was somebody else shouting. It was somebody else whispering. It was not me. Jesus is God. And Muhammad is a false prophet. That's what I believe. But Muhammad doesn't do anything like this. Neither does Allah send in any correction. Why? Because this was actually uttered honestly by Muhammad. So regardless of how you might try to whitewash this, this thing actually happened. The couplet was new, not old. So this is something else. So toward then he continues with the same uh, discussion. And then Some missionaries think the same way. This whole incident is true and it actually happened. Let us assume that this happened. This in no way disproves the prophethood of Muhammad, peace upon him. It actually does nothing but convince us even more that he truly was a prophet from God. Because Satan was exposed and the Prophet was protected by God. Because Satan was exposed and the Prophet was protected by God. If he agree, Satan deceived the Prophet to the him. If he agree, Satan deceived the Prophet to the him. For those few seconds by whispering those verses into him and tricking him into saying it, However, later on God protected his prophet and removed Satan and exposed Satan's failure in his attempt to bring people into idol worship. So his fire was interrupted. Now this so-called exposing of Satan was the same Surah uh, 22 that he said happened years after the so-called, after the incident of the satanic verses. So Allah rebuked, preserved his prophet and rebuked Satan years after this folly had been committed. Would you in any true frame of mind accept this? But this is what Islam wants us to believe. This is what Muslims would like us to believe. And this is where I, it brings me to the next part of my presentation. Frequently, Muslims come up and say that Muhammad is a prophet like unto Moses. But then we read in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 to 5, If the prophets are those who divine by dreams appear among you and promise you omens or potents, and the, and the omens or potents declared by them take place, and they say, let us follow other gods. And then we see uh, towards the end, but those prophets or those divine dreams shall be put to death, 
for or for having spoken treason against the Lord your God. So we shall purge evil from your midst. Now, if this thing, if Muhammad was living at the time of Moses, he would have been stoned to death. So the so-called prophet who was supposed to be like Moses would have been dead during the time of Moses. The same thing we read, like 18 verse 20, the, 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 the section that uh, Muslims claim as the prophet of Muhammad but we read in 18 verse 20, but a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to that. So had Muhammad lived, Muhammad was lucky enough. Had he lived during the time of Moses and he would have been stoned to death because he did speak in the name of other gods. Let me read Ibn Ishaq chapter 16, uh, page number 166 again. And here it's written, Satan, when he was 165 at the bottom line, I'm reading, Satan, when he was meditating upon, when he means uh, uh, Muhammad, when he was meditating upon it and desiring to bring it, that is reconciliation to his people, put upon his tongue, these are the exalted daring whose intercession is approved. So here it is very clear that Satan put this in the tongue of Muhammad to speak. It is written very clearly very clearly in 165-166 Satan, when I'm reading again, when he was meditating upon it and desiring to bring it to his people, put upon his tongue. These are the exalted garing whose intercession is approved. As per Ibn Ishaq, the earliest, one of the earliest biographers of Muhammad's life, these words were put on the tongue of Muhammad by Satan. But of course, he goes on to say that later on, after some time, after a few months, uh, Allah negates those words. But now if I read um, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, it says, A prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to that. So Moses would have commanded the execution of Muhammad had Muhammad lived at the time of Moses, uh, you know, the prophet that he wants to become that is so that is how it is brothers and sisters if you look at the quran and the way things are and so again your uh, th this is a very defining time if you are not a christian uh, you need to choose what gate would you like to go for where the bible says very clearly in matthew chapter 7 verse 13 to 14 narrow is the gate that leads to the heaven and there are few who find it and wide is a path that leads to hell and there are many who choose it. So would you be looking at choosing the wide path or the narrow path? It is for you to make a decision. So make the right choice. And here we see again in the same book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. And then again, in my closing, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So thank you so much for watching. Do you view the entire debate? It will be there in the description of this video. All content is copy free, uh, copyright free. Feel free to share, uh, to share it. Do like, share and subscribe. Now going through before I end, before I end again, brothers and sisters, uh, I would just like to end on one point. That is, uh, you know, uh, Brother Nathan has put, Allah has seen, uh, 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 okay, he has narrated a very nice verse, Surah chapter 2 verse 7, Allah has set a seal upon their hearts and upon their hearing and over their vision is a veil and for them is a great punishment. So anyway, thanks for that quote, brothers. So thank you so much for being there and watching. I really hope this helped. Do put in your comments and I look forward to seeing you soon with my next round of reputations for Dr. Shoaib. Thank you again, brothers and sisters. Take care and God bless you. Bye-bye.